Chapter 22, I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter Belen forces me to go to the soccer game, even though I tell her I have a hatred for sports that is located deep inside my entrails. She says it doesn't matter. That's not the point of going. Soccer games are where young people hang out and hook up. There's not much else to do in Los Ojos. Stare at the mountains, chase chickens, shoot bottles. We sit on the top bleachers with Belen's friends, a group of mildly attractive girls who wear way too much makeup. Although they don't say anything petty or snarky, I can tell right away that they're jealous of my cousin. I don't know why I always notice these types of things. There's something about the way their eyes outline her body and settle on her face, a sort of longing. It's not that they want her, it's that they want to be her. After Los Tigres score their first goal, a dark guy in a cowboy hat comes towards us with bottles of coke and plastic bags of pork skins slathered in red salsa. He distributes the drinks and snacks to everyone in our group and squeezes between me and Belen. All the girls laugh as if it were the funniest thing they've ever seen. I can feel the beads of sweat form on my upper lip. How are you doing tonight, Senorita Reyes? At first I wonder how he knows my last name or who I am, but then I remember everyone knows everyone's business in Los Ojos. Dio Chucho says you can't even fart without the whole town finding out. Medium, I say, looking at the field, trying for once in my life to understand a sport. He laughs. Why won't you look at me? I shrug. I'm mute all of a sudden. Don't mind Esteban, Belen says, smirking. He can be a little pesado sometimes. I wouldn't call him pesado, but he's definitely assertive. I can't keep myself from staring at his dark and veiny forearms. I imagine how they would feel against my fingertips. I cross my legs so they don't brush against his. After the game, Belen and her giggling friends flee before I can ask them to wait for me. I guess I should walk you home, Esteban smiles. His teeth are bright and perfect. Yeah, I guess, I say, remembering what Belen said about walking alone at night. The sky is beginning to purple. I can see the sun and moon at the same time. Esteban makes me feel as if something were filling my chest with warm syrup, as if all my bones were being slowly removed from my body. For a second, I wonder what Connor might be doing, if he still thinks about me. But I remind myself that things are over between us. I have no idea why, but even though I just met Esteban and know virtually nothing about him, he makes me feel all goopy inside. A truck blasting a narco corrido wakes me from my reverie. When we get to the corner of Mama Jacinta's block, Esteban takes my hand. I've liked you since you got here. Well, I'd never seen you before, so that's kind of weird. I'm too nervous to look at him. Why do I have to be such an asshole, even when I don't want to be? You don't remember seeing me that time you and Belen came into the fruit store? That's where I work. I knew I had felt someone looking at me that day, but I didn't bother searching for the source. It's funny how your body knows things before you do. I shake my head. No, I didn't see you. Esteban's dark skin glistens under the streetlight. It reminds me of coffee. I want so much to touch his face, but I don't. We sit in Tia Fermina's backyard gnawing on figs we picked from her tree. Tio Raul and Tio Leonel are inside watching the news. The sky is full of stars, and I stare at it in awe for such a long time that everyone notices and laughs at me. How could I forget the nights were like this? Poor city girl, Tio Chucho says, smiling. She probably never sees stars in Chicago. Not really, maybe three or four at a time if I'm lucky, I say, and pick a tiny leaf from my sweater. I look back up and think about how some stars don't even really exist anymore, that seeing them is seeing the past. It's hard for me to wrap my brain around that. What a mind fuck. The ground feels good under my bare feet. Tia Estela sits behind me in a chair and braids my hair. Her fingers cool against the back of my neck. Her hands in my hair are soothing. She's gentle, doesn't yank my hair like a ma used to when I was a kid. Dios mío, mija, Tia Estela says as she holds the braid up for everyone to see. You have so much hair. How do you walk around like this? Doesn't your head feel heavy? Sometimes when it's wet, I say, and wonder what it would feel like to chop off all of my hair. What would I look like? I've had long hair my entire life. When I was born, my hair was ridiculous shock of black. Ama said the doctors and nurses had never seen anything like it. I feel Belen stare at me from across the yard. I think she's used to being the beautiful one and doesn't appreciate the attention I'm receiving. It's both uncomfortable and satisfying at the same time. Beautiful hair runs in the family, Mama Jacinta says. Though you wouldn't know, 
Looking at mine now, she runs her hand through her short gray hair and smiles. The old chucho grins and shakes his hair as if he were in a shampoo commercial. It's true. I look like a movie star. I've eaten so many figs that my stomach hurts, but I can't stop. I love the taste of the sweet flesh, the crunch of tiny seeds between my teeth. The night is always perfect here, never too cold. The air smelling of dirt and leaves. I think I almost get a whiff of the river. Then remember it's practically dried up. A phantom smell, I guess. I can't think of anything more calming than the sound of crickets and the rustle of the fig tree. If Thea had a hammock, I would ask to sleep here every single night. The white and yellow roses planted in old buckets are thriving despite the drought because Thea Fermina cares for them as if they were children. Their persistence makes me feel hopeful. Andres gets up from his chair and approaches a cactus in the corner of the yard. I wonder what he's doing, but I don't ask. He presses his finger to the bud and whispers something. After a few seconds, he turns to all of us and says, This one never bloomed, and the season's almost over. He frowns. What kind of flower is that, I ask? Nocturnal cactus flower. Forget the name, but this one is a flop, I think. I've never heard of that. That's, that's amazing. I run out of words. A flower that blooms only at night sounds like something out of a fairy tale. Tia Fermina comes out from the kitchen with a jug of agua de jamaica and pours each of us a glass. This is good for digestion and high cholesterol. After eating those carnitas tonight, we all need it. Tia Fermina is the oldest and always tries to take care of everybody. It's almost hard to believe that she's Belen's mother because Belen is kind of selfish, mostly concerned with how pretty she is. The first night I got here, Tia Fermina gave me a small cloth bag full of pa paper worry dolls. She told me that before I go to sleep each night, I should tell them all my worries and put them under my pillow. They're supposed to disappear by morning. I never told her it didn't work. The agua de jamaica is tart, sweet, and refreshing. I pour myself another glass. If the night were made into a drink, it would taste like this. Tia Fermina takes me to Delicias three times over to buy some cheese. Supposedly, it's the best in the whole state, and I think I might agree because it's sharp, creamy, and melts perfectly. It tastes amazing in enchiladas, a cheese worthy of a pilgrimage. Thea complains about the drought the whole ride over. It's ruining all the crops, she says. The cows are emaciated. People don't know what to do anymore. The land is definitely drier than I remember. The trees are yellow and brittle. Everything in the desert hunkers toward the ground. The wisaches that dot the mountains are short and the twigs are armed with spines. Everything protects itself with needles here. Once in a while, a pregnant cloud hovers and teases the land with a trickle of rain. Tia Fermina is a few years older than Amma, and though they look so much alike, same black hair, light skin, and bright red lips, she's just not as pretty. That doesn't mean she's not attractive, though. Tia has a captivating face like all the Montenegro women. It's just that hardly anyone is as beautiful as Amma. I wonder what it was like for them growing up. Did Tia always compare herself to her? Was she jealous? Did she ever wish she had crossed to the other side like her little sister? We parked the truck at the bottom of a hill because it won't fit through the narrow streets. I suddenly have deja vu. I know I came to this town with Mama Jacinta once, long ago, but I don't remember why exactly. Did it have something to do with a goat, or am I making that up? Sometimes my memory feels like a smeared photograph. How is your mother? The Fermina asks as we pant our way up. Have you talked to her? She called me yesterday. She sounds okay. How was she before, you know, when she lost Olga? She couldn't get out of bed. Just when I thought she was doing better, she'd go right back to sleeping for days and days. She hardly ate or drank anything. It scared me. She hasn't done that in a while, though. A man walks a blindfolded bull across the street. Buenos dias, he says, and tips his hat. That's the thing about Mexico. You have to say hello to people you don't even know. My poor sister, and all of us here useless, unable to help her. Ay, Diosito, Tia Fermina says. Every time I called her, she'd tell me she was fine. But I knew she wasn't. Of course she wasn't. How could she be fine without her daughter? That's the worst thing that could ever happen to you. I can't even fathom it. God forbid she crosses herself. She wasn't fine, and neither was I. Ay, mija, I can't imagine what it's like to lose your sister. Tia turns to me and touches my face. Pobre criatura. And what about you and your mother? I know you two have fought a lot over the years. She's always said you were very terca. 
That's how I've been described my whole life. Terca, necia, cabezona, all the synonyms for stubborn and difficult. A gust of wind carries the smell of burning garbage toward us. Yeah, we don't really understand each other. You need to try harder, especially with your sister gone. You're all she has, Julia. She loves you so much. Maybe you don't see that. I don't know. Just please don't make her life harder. I ask you as your aunt, as your mother's sister, please be good to her. Tia Fermina is out of breath now. She stops and wipes the sweat from her face with her forearm. I don't think Ama told her I tried to kill myself. You don't understand, Tia. I try. I really do. We're just so different. She thinks I'm wild and crazy, but I want makes sense to me. I want to be independent. I want to be my own person with my own life. I want to make my own choices and mistakes. And she wants to know what I'm doing every second of the day. It makes me feel like I'm drowning. Ay, mija, there is so much you don't understand. Why does everyone say that to me? I know I'm young, but I'm not stupid. That's not what I mean. It's that your mother has had such a hard life you can't even imagine. I know. She reminds me of it all the time. She's always telling me how hard she works and that I'm ungrateful. Tia Fermina doesn't say anything for a long time. Tia, are you okay? I'm only telling this so you can understand, so you can have more compassion. She looks at the sky. God forgive me for doing this. My muscles tense. I'm suddenly overwhelmed with thirst. What? What is it? Tell me. Tell me now. I want to know. Now. Tia finally looks at me. You know how your parents crossed the border? I've heard the story several times. Ama left with Tapa against her mother's will. They crossed with a coyote. When they got to Texas, a man stole all their money. They stayed in El Paso with Tapa's distant cousin and worked at a restaurant until they were able to save enough money to take the bus to Chicago. It was in the middle of winter and they didn't have jackets. Ama says she had never felt so cold in her life. She thought her eyes would freeze inside her head. That's all I knew. Your mother, El Coyote. Tia looks like she's trying to untangle what she needs to say. She begins to cry. He took her. He took her where? I scream. I don't mean to, but it just comes out that way. Where did he take her? What did he do? I squeeze her hand so hard I think I might break her fingers. Tia can't get the words out. My brain is pounding. A tattered gray cat darts past us. I can't say it. I shouldn't have told you this. God forgive me. Tia Fermina covers her mouth with her hand. She doesn't have to finish. And Apa? Where was he? What did he do? I can't stop screaming. They held him down with a gun. There was nothing he could do. Tia Fermina shakes her head. No! No, that can't be true. No! I can't. I just sit down on the ground near a mound of red ants, but I don't care. My body feels like it weighs a thousand pounds. I picture my mother's face streaked with tears and dirt. My father bowing his head in defeat. And Olga? What about Olga? She was... She was... I can't get the words out. Tia Fermina clasps her hands to her chest and nods. See, sí, mija, that's why I want you to know. So when you and your mother fight, you can see where she's come from and understand what's happened to her. She doesn't mean to hurt you. That night, I don't fall asleep until morning. I just lie there thinking about my parents and how little I know them. I wake up at noon, my body aching. Because I don't have anywhere to go, no real obligations, the days blend together. I can't even tell them apart most of the time. I wake up, eat breakfast, help Mama Jacinta cook and clean, and then lie around reading and writing. After Belen gets home from school, she and I wander through the town aimlessly, eating all the junk food that will fit inside our bodies, well, at least when my appetite hasn't disappeared. Sometimes we meet Esteban after he gets out of work. We either sit on a bench or walk around the square until we have to go home. Belen always leaves us alone for a while. She pretends she needs to run an errand, but I know exactly what she's doing. Esteban has never tried to kiss me, and it's all I can think about. I imagine his thick lips on mine. I picture his hands running through my hair and down my back, his body pressed against me. I never do anything about it, though. I feel as scared and vulnerable as a plucked bird. I know he said he liked me, but what if he didn't really mean it? What if he thinks I'm weird? What if I'm not pretty enough? Besides, how could I with the whole town watching? I just sit there like a fool, making small talk and boring observations about stray animals, hoping I don't embarrass myself with my limited Spanish vocabulary. Today, Esteban is wearing jeans, a faded Beatles t-shirt, and a straw cowboy hat. I like the combination. Where did you get that shirt? My cousin left it at my house and I kept it, he says, smiling. Do you even like the Beatles? Not really. You're weird. A mangy stray dog creeps towards us and begins sniffing me. 
Esteban seems very amused by this. Weird, huh? Yeah, everyone likes the Beatles. Apparently, that dog likes you. He points his chin toward it. He's not my type. Esteban laughs. You're silly, you know that? What exactly is your type then? I prefer them to be better groomed, not so many fleas. Esteban smiles and pats my hand. I almost gasp and feel my eyes bug out with surprise. I'm so nervous I can't even move. We sit like that for a few seconds until Belen comes out of the store with a sack of meat we have to take to Mama Jacinta's for dinner. I jump up and leave without looking at Esteban, my heart inside my mouth. Belen, my tias, Mama Jacinta, and I watch telenovelas. That's what all the women in Los Ojos do at that hour. They're all glued to their televisions. I could probably run around with my hair on fire, and they wouldn't even notice. During the opening credits of La Casa de Traición, a horrible show about a rich family with a shameful past, we hear shouting inside, Hijo de tu pinche madre! A man yells, You're going to pay! Belen mutes the TV, and we all stare at each other, confused. I can't understand the rest of the yelling. The only words I can make out are puto and piedra. The car horn, tires screech, a dog barks. The commotion stops after a few seconds, and just when we think it's over, the gunshots begin. Everyone drops to the floor, even poor Mama Jacinta. Again? I thought this has ended. She says, why, God, why? Tia Fermina rubs her back and tries to calm her down, but Mama Jacinta whimpers and cries. She is distraught beyond consolation. Tia Estela crosses herself over and over. Everyone crawls toward the back of the house. I'm the last one. I peek out the crack door before I go. Two dead bodies are lying in the middle of the street. Tia Fermina says she needs to give me a limpia to get rid of my susto. She says they can't send me home like this after what happened. What would my mother say? My family members claim that a scare can kill you. I call that a heart attack, but whatever. I'll go along with this if it makes everyone feel better. Tia takes me to the storage room where Mama Jacinta keeps her extra dry food. There are sacks of flour, beans, and dry corn scattered on the floor. I lie on a small cot, and once I get comfortable, Tia Fermina makes little crosses all over my body with an egg, beginning with my head and working her way down to my feet. The cool shell against my skin feels comforting. When I was little, I was confused about the process of this spiritual cleansing. All I knew was that it involved an egg, so I imagined they used a cooked one, likely fried, which left the recipient greasy and smeared the yolk. Boy, was I stupid, but I figured out when I saw them do it to my cousin Vanessa after she was almost hit by a car. The raw egg traps all the rotten crap clogging up your soul. Tia Fermina whispers the prayer so faintly, I can't understand them. After she makes dozens of crosses all over my body, she says it's time to see inside the egg, to understand what's been stewing inside of me. Tia cracks the egg into a glass of water and holds it up to the light. The water turns thick and cloudy, and when we look closer, we see a dot of dark blood in the center of the yolk. Dios mío, mija, Tia gasps. What's going on with you? I have to go back home because Mama Jacinta is afraid the narcos will continue killing each other. After a year and a half of relative peace, Los Ojos has erupted into violence again. She tells me I need to take the bus to the airport because it's much less likely that the narcos will pull us over. It's especially dangerous for Tio Chucho to drive since the cartel has been after Andres for years. Why did Tio Chucho give that man an envelope? I asked Mama Jacinta before bed. At Paulina's party. She sighs. It's a bribe, so they'll leave Andres alone. They want him to work for them, and they come around every once in a while. Can you imagine working for those animals? Ni Dios lo mande. Those men have no soul. Forcing a man with no money to pay them like that? Your tío is a humble truck driver who does his best to provide for his family. What's left of it? Ay, Dios mío. My little town has turned to garbage. Mama Jacinta presses her palms to her eyes. Please stop worrying about what happened and try to get some rest. You'll be home soon. I didn't know this would happen, mija. I'm sorry. I thought the fighting was over. Nothing like this has happened in a long time. She makes a sign of the cross and gives me a kiss goodnight. It's okay. It's not your fault, I say. Part of me wants to tell her I know what happened to Ama. It beats inside me like another heart, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to say it out loud. Esteban says he'll miss me, and I tell him that he won't. How could he? He hardly knows me. He just laughs, though. He laughs at nearly everything I say, even when I'm not trying to be funny. Maybe I'll see you on the other side, he tells me at the square. I might be crossing soon. I can't work at the fruit store forever. There's nothing for me here. I'm sick of this place. He looks around disgusted and kicks a rock toward the empty fountain.
Be careful, please. The border. The fucking border. I feel a wildness spreading through me. It's nothing but a giant wound, a big gash between the two countries. Why does it have to be like that? I don't understand. It's just some random stupid line. How can anyone tell people where they can and can't go? I don't understand either. Esteban takes off his cowboy hat and looks toward the mountains. All I know is that I've had enough of this life. It's bullshit. Utter bullshit. I clench my fists and close my eyes. Esteban cradles my face in his hands and pulls me toward him. The whole town will probably find out within the hour, but I don't even care. I cry quietly in the bus after I say goodbye to my family. I don't look outside because if I see Mama Jacinta standing there staring at me, which I'm certain she is, I'll probably start wailing. After she gave me la bendición, she handed me a paz drawing and said she trusted me to take care of my mother. You are a beautiful young woman. You will do amazing things. Please just make sure you look after my daughter. I never imagined I would have to protect and care for my mother. I didn't know that was my job, but I said yes, of course. How could I not? I try to sleep when the bus finally pulls away, but the man in front of me is snoring so loudly he wakes himself up every few minutes. His snores are so deep it sounds as if he's being suffocated by his own flesh. I stare out the window and study the brown and brittle land. The worst drought in ten years, they say. Every few miles, I see a bright desert flower or white crosses with plastic roses on the side of the road. I wonder why so many people die here. The sun begins to set as we finally approach the city. The colors are so beautiful, they're almost violent. I feel a pang in my chest and remember a line from a poem I read a long time ago about terror being the beginning of beauty, or something like that. I don't quite remember. There's a dead donkey in a field behind a barbed wire fence. Its legs are bent and stiff and its mouth is open as if it had been smiling when it died. Two vultures circle above it. Chapter 23 Ama takes me to a restaurant in Chinatown after she picks me up from the airport. I can hardly believe it because I honestly don't remember the last time we ate at a restaurant together. The tables are sticky and it smells like old carpet, but I'm glad I'm there with her. Plus, she said her co-worker told her it was good. Maybe I shouldn't judge a book by its cover for once in my life. We sit by the window because I tell Ama I want to look outside. Chicago is finally beginning to thaw. Most of the snow has melted except for a few dirty patches and everyone looks brighter, more alive. A red fish with a mean face swims in a tank near the register. Ama laughs when I told her that I think he's giving us dirty looks. Your grandma tells me you helped her so much, Ama says smiling. It was nice. I didn't realize how much I'd missed her. See, I told you it would make you feel better. Yeah, I guess so. The shooting was scary, though. I take a deep breath. I'm so sorry about that, mija. They told me it was calm when I sent you. Nothing like that had happened in over a year. You know I wouldn't have let you go if I had known. I'm fine. It's okay. It's not your fault. Your teacher called me last week, Ama says and slurps her tea. Which one? Mr. Ingman. But he's not even my teacher anymore. Why would he call you? What did he say? He heard you were out of school for a few weeks. He was worried. I told him you were in Mexico because of a family matter. And he said that it was very important that you come back so you can graduate and go to college. He kept telling me you were the best student he's ever had. That you're an amazing writer. I didn't even know. Why didn't you tell me? It's always been hard for me to explain these things to Ama. I tried. I say I really did. You know, I hardly went to school. I had to drop out to work and to help take care of my family when I was only 13. I'm ignorant, mija. Can't you see that? There are so many things I don't know. I wish things were different. I know you hate me, but I love you with all my heart. I always have, ever since I knew I was pregnant with you. I just don't want anything to ever happen to you. I worry and worry all the time. It eats away at me like you can't believe. All I do is think of ways to protect you. Ama begins to cry. She dabs her eyes with the corner of her napkin. I don't hate you, Ama. I don't hate you at all. Please don't say that. The waitress brings us our food. I love sweet and sour chicken. It normally makes me salivate like a St. Bernard, but I'm not hungry anymore. Ama, of course, has ordered a plate of steamed vegetables. I look up at the ceiling, trying to keep myself from crying, but it's no use. Everyone can watch us if they want. 
I know I'm not the best mother sometimes. You're just so different, Julia. I've never known how to deal with you. And then after your sister died, I had no idea what I was doing. When I found out you were having sex, I was so scared you'd end up like your cousin Vanessa, alone and with a baby. I don't want you to have that kind of life. I want you to have a good job and get married. Ama takes a deep breath. I've been talking to the priest lately. He's been helping me understand all of this better. She puts her hand over mine. I'm sorry, I really am. And, and, I know what happened to your sister was not your fault. I never should have said that. I'm just trying to put myself back together, but it's so hard, mija. I can't look at Ama without thinking about the border. I keep picturing her screaming on the ground, Apa with a gun to his head. I don't think I can ever tell her that I know. But how do we live with these secrets locked within us? How do we tie our shoes, brush our hair, drink coffee, wash the dishes and go to sleep, pretending everything is fine? How do we laugh and feel happiness despite the buried things growing inside? How can we do that day after day? I'm sorry too, I finally say. I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry I wanted to die. Ama returns my phone to me when I get home, so I decide to call Connor. Now I miss both him and Esteban. Love or whatever, I don't even know what I feel, is confusing. I wonder if it's normal to have feelings for two people. When I turn the phone on, I see that I have 15 texts and 11 voicemails, and they're all from Connor. Most of them are the same. I hope you're okay, I miss you, please call me back. I can hardly breathe as I wait for him to pick up the phone. I almost hang up when he answers. Oh my God, it's you, he says. I'm so nervous my voice cracks, how are you? I called you a million times. Why didn't you ever answer? I was hoping you had your phone back. I was in Mexico. What? Mexico? What were you doing there? It's kind of a long story. I'll have to explain it in person. It's too complicated to tell you over the phone. I thought you hated me. I don't. Not at all. I still want to help you with your sister's laptop, you know? Thank you. I appreciate that. But, well, that's something else I'd rather explain in person. Listen, I missed you. I'm sorry about before. It's okay. It was mostly my fault. I should have let you finish. I shouldn't have hung up. And I missed you too. I have so many stories for you. One involves two married horses. Connor laughs. That sounds pretty crazy. Man, you have no idea. Meet me at the bookstore tomorrow at 5.30. We can sniff books together. I don't even know if Ama will let me go, but I have to find a way to see Connor again. When we hang up, I walk to Ama at the kitchen table. She's staring at a pile of bills. Ama, I say quietly, can I please go out with Lorena tomorrow? There's no way I'd ever tell her about Connor, so I have no choice but to lie. I hold my breath, waiting for her to say no. Ama rubs her temples. Where? I don't know, downtown or something, the park, somewhere not here. I haven't seen her in a long time. Ama is silent for a while. She looks like she's thinking hard, holding her fingers to her forehead. Ay, Dios, she finally says. Please? Fine, but you have to be back before it's dark. Ama looks like it pains her to say it. Because Ama is making such an effort to be a better mother, I've decided to be a better daughter. So I, I agree to attend a prayer group at our church that night. It's in the same basement as my quinceanera, and when we walk down the stairs, I get flashbacks of that horrible night. I hope Ama isn't thinking about it, but I'm nearly certain she is. How could she not? The most exciting thing about the church group is the free coffee and cookies, which I run to immediately. There are a few things better than vanilla wafers dunked in milky coffee. The leader of the group is a middle-aged woman named Adelita. She's wearing a very fashionable fleece vest, and her hair is cut short like a lot of women's when they get older. I really don't understand why that's a requirement once you reach middle age. Adelita begins with an Our Father, then adds her own prayer at the end. I hope that everyone here finds the love and understanding they're looking for. God lives in each and every one of you, she says. Adelita tells us about her 10-year-old son who died after a long, painful battle with leukemia. Even though it's been 15 years, his death haunts her every day of her life, she says. When she begins describing his amputated leg, a tear trickles down my face against my will. Are you okay, mija? Ama whispers, placing her hand on my knee. I nod. Next is a man named Gonzalo who is wearing blue work pants and a Bugs Bunny t-shirt that's probably from the 90s, which depresses me like few things can. He tells the group that his son is gay and he doesn't know how to forgive him. Forgive him for what? I ask when he's finished. 
Julia, be quiet, Ama says. I'm already embarrassing her like always. It's okay for her to ask questions, says Adelita. I just don't understand, I go on. Being gay isn't a choice, don't you know that? What do you mean? You don't understand. What he's doing is a sin. Gonzalo is all worked up now, his fists clenched and his face flushed. Whatever compassion I had for him and his Bugs Bunny t-shirt has quickly evaporated. I'm sure that your son would do anything to stop being gay to avoid dealing with you. Besides, didn't Jesus preach that you should love everyone? Isn't that what Christianity is all about? Or did I miss something? If I keep going, I think Gonzalo might punch me in the face, so I stop. I can feel Alma's anger quivering beside me, but she doesn't say anything. By the time it's her turn, we've heard about her affairs, deaths, abused gay children, bankruptcy, and deportations. My soul is a puddle at my feet. As you know, I lost Olga almost two years ago. I think about her always. There's not a moment that passes that I don't feel her absence. She was my companion, my friend. I don't know when I'll feel like myself again. It's like I've been cut in half. And Julia here, my beautiful daughter, I love her so much, but she is so, so different. I know she's a special kind of person. I know she's smart and strong, but we don't always understand each other. Olga, for example, always wanted to be at home with us, loved to be close to her family. And Julia can never sit still. Ama blows her nose. Where I grew up, women were supposed to stay at home and take care of their families. The way women live in this country, having relations with cualquier fulano and living on their own, I just don't understand it. Maybe my morals are too different for this place, I don't know. Ama looks at the crumpled tissue in her hand. She has no idea who Olga was, but how do I tell her that? Do I even have the right? That's not how I want to live, Ama. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to speak, but I can't help it. I'm sorry that I'm not Olga, and I never will be. I love you, but I want a different life for myself. I don't want to stay home. I don't even know if I ever wanted to get married or have kids. I want to go to school. I want to see the world. I want so many things, sometimes I can't even stand it. I feel like I'm going to explode. Ama doesn't say anything. We all sit in silence until Adelita tells us to hold hands for the closing prayer. Once my parents are asleep, I use my extra key to go back into Olga's room to see if I can finish reading her emails. It turns out I did leave her computer unlocked, which is a huge relief. The neighbor's internet is slow, but at least it works. This time, I read the newest emails first. I don't have the patience to go in order. Most of the emails are the same. Planning when to meet, Olga complaining about his wife, Olga asking when he's going to leave her, him promising that he will. Sometimes he begs for forgiveness, sometimes he doesn't. They repeat with little variation. They never use each other's names or specific locations. I assume what they keep referring to as a sea is the continental. From what I can tell, it sounds like his children are probably in high school, which means they are almost Olga's age, and I'm certain he's been married for 20 years since he tells Olga that over and over, as if somehow that justifies any. How could she have put up with it for such a long time? What did she think was really going to happen? This is a side of Olga I never saw, desperate, clingy, and delusional. Here I thought she was virginal, passive, and complacent, letting the world pass her by, when in fact, she was letting the world pass her by while having sex with an old married dude, hoping he would one day leave his wife. She wasted four whole years with him, from the age of 18, when she started working at the office, to the day she died. What was she thinking? No wonder she was static. No wonder she never wanted to leave and go to school. She was waiting, and she would have been waiting forever. Then it strikes me. I think to check the scent box. Maybe she sent an email he never answered. Los Ojos at bmail.com 5.05 p.m. September 5th, 2013. The ultrasound was yesterday. Why didn't you show up? I left the picture in your desk if you even care to look at it. My dead sister was going to have a baby. Chapter 24 I call the hotel where Angie works and hang up when I hear her voice. I'm in front of her building two trains later. The hotel is luxurious and full of men in suits and perfectly groomed women in high heels. Everything is shiny to an oppressive degree. I can practically see my reflection in the marble floor. 
A middle-aged lady with a pointy nose and expensive trench coat scowls at me when I enter the lobby, like I don't belong there, like my existence offends her sensibilities or something. I smile and wave at her, hoping she can detect my irony. I wonder how much it would cost to spend the night here. Probably hundreds, maybe thousands. Angie is at the front desk, which is what I was hoping, wearing a navy blue pantsuit that makes her look ten years older. Her wild hair is drawn into a tight ponytail, and her makeup is muted and faint. Maybe the dress code requires them to look as dull as humanly possible. Angie, of course, is surprised to see me. Oh my God, what are you doing here? She sets down the phone. It's so nice to see you too, Angie. It's been so long, really. Angie sighs. How are you? Oh, I'm just wonderful. I can't really talk right now. I'm working, as you can see. She rubs her neck and looks around nervously. You don't have time to talk to me about Olga's pregnancy and married boyfriend? I smile. What? You heard me. Let's go get some coffee. Angie grabs her purse and turns to her blonde co-worker at the end of the counter. Melissa, I'll be back soon, taking a quick break. When we settle in a corner table in the coffee shop across the street, Angie searches inside her purse and puts on another coat of pale lipstick, using her phone as a mirror. She doesn't say anything. She must be waiting for me to go first. So I just sip my coffee and let her squirm for a while. So, why didn't you tell me? You knew this the whole time, I finally say. Why would you do that to me? I'm her fucking sister, Angie. What would anyone gain from that? She's gone. She's never coming back. What difference would that have made? Why would your family want to know that about her? It would have devastated them. Maybe you're too young to understand, Julia, but sometimes people don't need the truth. Why is everyone always saying that to me? I'm not an imbecile. I have a brain, a pretty good one too, and they would have found out eventually. How was she going to hide a baby coming out of her? Oh, don't mind this child here. It was a result of immaculate conception. Just tell me who he is. I know he worked in her office. You have to tell me. He was a doctor, wasn't he? Angie shakes her head. Look, I tried to get her to leave him for years, but she wouldn't. There was no stopping her. She was obsessed. You have no idea. It was obvious he was just using her because he was in a miserable marriage, but she couldn't see that no matter how many times I tried to explain it to her. I was even starting to think that you guys were a couple. I didn't know what to believe. Wow, seriously, me and your sister? It's not that ridiculous. I knew you were keeping something from me and you were always together. Angie looks disgusted. When did you find out about the baby? Wait, how do you even know about all of this? She puts both hands on the table. I went through her emails. Well, that's kind of messed up. More messed up than keeping the secret? Than letting me think I was crazy for sensing something was wrong? Why do you want to know who it is, though? What are you going to do once you find out? Because I deserve to know. Because I apparently had no idea who Olga was. I guess none of us did, except for you and that old guy she was banging. Why was she living like that? Why couldn't she just have a normal boyfriend and go to school? I don't get it. You know, Olga never wanted to leave your parents. She would have done anything for them. She always wanted to be a good daughter. I wonder what else Angie knows. I try to read it in her face, but I don't know what to make of it. They should know about this. It's not fair to me or to them. How am I going to carry this by myself my whole damn life? I'm sorry. I understand that it hurts. Believe me. But this isn't about you. This is about protecting those who are still here. Why would you want to cause your family more pain? Because we shouldn't be living lies, I say. Because they deserve to know. Because I feel like I'm going to explode if I don't say it. It's all I can think about. I'm tired of pretending and letting things blister inside me. Keeping things to myself almost killed me. I don't want to live like that anymore. What are you talking about? Forget it. Part of me wonders if Angie is right. Who am I to do this to my family? But I hate this feeling. Like the weight of this will make my chest collapse. Angie wipes the tears from her eyes with her palms. Something should never be said out loud, Julia. Can't you see that? I take another train to Wicker Park to meet Connor at the bookstore. As soon as he sees me, he hands me an old photography book and asks me what it smells like. I press it against my face. Hmm. A sad man looking out the window as it rains. Lamenting a time at the train station. Yeah, that's it. This makes Connor laugh. Wow, that's specific, he says. Is he wearing a hat? Uh-huh, pork pie. It's good to see you, he says, and hugs me. Lovely to see you too, sir. I see you have a new hairstyle. Connor's shaggy brown hair is now short and neat. It makes him look older. He shrugs. Yeah, I got sick of it one day. 
I like it, I say. You look distinguished. We walk through the bookstore as we catch up on the last several weeks. We're laughing and talking so fast that people stare at us as if we're crazy. I tell them about Isabella and Sebastian, the gay cats, the shooting, Apa's drawings, Olga's affair. I'm almost out of breath trying to cram it all in. I don't tell him about the hospital, though. I'm not ready to talk about it yet. After the bookstore, we talk to the 606. One of the best decisions the city has ever made was to convert an old rail line into an elevated park. The trail spans two and a half miles from Wicker Park to Humboldt Park, and it has great views of the skyline and neighborhoods below. Though it's chilly today, there are several people walking and running, some with strollers and dogs. The trees and bushes are mostly bare, but I see a few green blades emerging. Connor and I walk west for a long time without saying anything. As I stare at the graffiti of an abandoned factory with shattered windows, he takes my hand and squeezes it. So what else have you been up to? I ask. Any new ladies in your life? I'm not sure why I say this. Sometimes I blurt out stupid things when I get nervous. Connor shakes his head and laughs, but he doesn't say no. A pulse of jealousy surges through me, even though I try to reason with myself. I had a Stevan, after all, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss him. Have you heard from any colleges yet, he asks. No, not yet. You? I got into Cornell, Connor smiles. Holy shit, congratulations. I give him a fist bump. Yeah, it's my top choice. I'm pretty excited. I applied to some schools in New York City, so maybe we'll be in the same state. I can visit you. We can go to museums or Central Park or just eat our way through Manhattan. Oh, and we can visit all the landmarks in The Catcher in the Rye. That would be fucking cool. Let's see if I get in first. You will. You know you will. Connor says as a guy with a man bun runs past us. Thanks. The sun is beginning to set. A blaze of orange light outlines a giant cloud. I love dusk. It always astonishes me that something so beautiful happens every single day. We're quiet for a long time. So what now? I finally say, what do you mean? I don't even know. <laughs> I laugh nervously. All I know is that I missed you. Connor smiles and hugs me. And I'm glad to see you. I miss you too. What's going to happen now though? We're both going away to college, right? So let's just enjoy this without overthinking it. That's what makes sense to me. A flock of pigeons flies over us as he takes both of my hands in his. You're right, I say, but that's not the answer I wanted to hear.